Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Pruitt. This is Jeffrey Reddick. This is Dexter from this The Offspring. Is Nathan East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lapp. This is Stuart Cope. This is Mick Gillette. I'm Krista Verna. This is Ryan Sick. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Pato Milo from Dead Cat Hat, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. This is a long time coming. We've been trying to arrange this for a while. I know. We were in a, a tiny little pub when you saw our band playing. Yeah. There were probably um, about 10 chairs in that or booths, or what do you call it, uh, stools. I was just telling Nico about how we met, and he said, and the bar's called Cullen's. They're our friends, so we can say, yeah, it's Cullen's. You should visit Benicia and go it's to tiny. Cullen's. It's tiny. I said that you and Alan were playing in Cullen's, and he went, in Cullen's? <laughs> and I said, Yes. In Cullen's. Inside. Sometimes you'd yes. get up on the bar. It's I'll tiny. Just, you know, stand on the bar. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, we'd go there and we'd have our, uh, sometimes a whole five piece band there. We'd have our, our drummer, Steve. Say hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Steve oh, <wait>. Glover. <laughs> Steve's here? Yeah. He's and here he, sitting Glover. in. He'd be shaking, uh, you know, whatever percussion shaking he something. had. Yeah. Right. Uh, a bass, guitar, guitar, and accordion. So we'd have the five of us all huddled up in a corner. Just playing tunes all night. A lot yep. of covers, our originals, whatever we wanted to do. Yeah. Well, I think why we hit it off was that, number one, I was just pissed drunk. No. Um, <laughs> I'd had a few drinks, but I, we were having a great time. It was SantaCon that year. Oh, God, yeah. <gasps> wall to yes. wall. Yes, wall to wall Santas. I and know. Boobs in my face. You guys had great... The covers that you were doing, you guys had clever arrangements. The instrumentation was neat. Steve's over there shaking something, and sometimes he's hitting it against his head. <laughs> you know, there's just every everything about it was just a good time. Yeah. And so we immediately bonded. And I think, if I remember this correctly, we had just recorded maybe our third episode of the show. Mm. And I hit you up and I was like, listen, we just started this podcast and you guys, well, we'd love to have you on as a guest. And I remember you and Alan both were like, hey, that sounds great. Let's. And then we yeah. just and, now getting around to it. And you've you've had some amazing guests over the 220 uh, something shows now. Yeah. And we uh, continue geez. to have amazing guests. Yeah. So. It's, it's, well, you know what? Actually, speaking of guests, just for a second, um, you had uh, Jeff Campitelli on. Oh, yeah. Just a few weeks ago we or love so. Jeff. Mm -hmm. He's a sweetheart. And, and um, I, I'll tell this little story about Jeff. We grew up in Danville, and he didn't know me. I, I was a few years younger than him. Okay. But we went to the same high school. Wait and a minute. You're a few years younger than Jeff? Yeah. Jeez, he's a good you look guy. like hell. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good looking guy, man. He is. He's held up very nicely, <laughs> Jeff. Good but, job. You know, he's a drummer for, uh, for um, uh, what's his face? Joe uh, Satriani. Satriani. Yeah. And, um, and he, there he is in our little town, Benicia, uh, playing with Steph Burns when he's in town. Yeah. With other guys. And, and uh, Killing, by the that's, way. That's Kempatelli. Yeah. Oh, my God. And I grew up watching his band, The Squares, mm -hmm. and all of his buddies that he hung out with. I used to see him at the Keystone. You actually watched The Squares. Yeah. I saw Sweet. The Squares. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so when I met him in Benicia, I had to shake his hand and I, I kind of overdid it. I was all excited. Hey, I'm from Danville. And I started listing all these kids that I grew up with in Danville. You yeah. know? And he's looking at me like, I don't know any of those people. Wow. <laughs> but he knew a few of them. But, um, yeah, but Danville days guy. were cool. He resisted. I was like, Jeff. Uh, in fact, you, we were, huh. that's the last time I saw you. Was oh, at the that night show? That we were watching Jeff. Yeah. And I said, Jeff, uh, you know, told him all about the show. And I said, I'd love to have you on. And of course, Jeff, he's a big ball of humility. He said, oh, I don't, I don't know if I have anything to say. And I definitely don't have an hour's worth. What are you going to do with an hour? Yeah. Um, so he came over. And when we finished an hour, we were just at, and that's when I met Joe Satriani. Oh, a whole so other show. We hadn't even gotten to, maybe we got a little further. Than, no, I'll, I'll take that back. And that's how we recorded the first album. And he's done something like 20 albums, mm -hmm. but he didn't have an hour in him, or so he thought. Yeah, right. And by the time we had finished an hour, we had only gotten as far in his career as the first Satriani album. So, uh, yeah, we had a great time. 
We had yeah. a great time. He's, he's a cool dude. He's a really cool dude. He's seen us play. He, he's seen us over at the townhouse. Yeah. We, we're just a little regional band here in the Bay Area, our, our little dead cat hat. We used to play down in San Francisco and Oakland, and mm-hmm. we'll get back to that again eventually. But lately, we've been having a lot of fun just in our little backyard here. Uh-huh. And you've recorded an EP. We have. Well, we our first album was 2012, and it's called Station Change, and it's a full-length 10 track album steve here played drums and we had uh at that time accordion bass guitar guitar and it's a kind of a straight up indie rock rock record Mm -hmm. with accordion yeah um little twists and turns here and there that's Uh, a twist and turn all by itself yeah well people are always surprised into crazy arrangement land and well the, the accordion would actually well the whole history of the band let me start with the history and then i'll catch up to the ep okay you know, my just. It, it, it I, wait, I just want to interject that we're drinking torpedo, tropical torpedo mm-hmm. IPA, tropical torpedo, which was oddly enough my nickname in the navy. Anyway, and ice water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm drinking ice water. It's yeah. a nice uh, we citrus hear, uh, taste. We hear the uh, ice clinking, which there. on this show often means a lot of things. Uh, today Uh-oh. it means what Steve's drinking ice water. We're lucky to have Steve as our designated driver, and pretty right. much all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I got bored with alcohol few years ago okay that's yeah. all that's good not like you know, so um, steps program all right so the band initially started as a two-piece alan and i were going to do kind of americana versions of our original music mm-hmm. and some of it was already kind of a country twang americana and some of it wasn't but we just we took older songs that he used to have and we just bent it into an americana sound and as a duo we played gigs for about six months so we even set up a, a tour to to seattle where he had lived for about 10 years. Um, and that's when we met Bonnie, who uh, back then was our accordion player. She worked in the music store downtown and heard us playing in the music store. She said, you guys, I'll be right back. She just left us with the store. <laughs> she ran home. Mm-hmm. She comes back five minutes later with this accordion and just starts jamming with us. <laughs> this is great. Right. Uh, well, she ran in. home to get her axe. <laughs> yeah. So, mm-hmm. so the band Dead Cat Hat really kind of had its roots then in a sort of an Americana country type thing. Yeah. That's funny. It, that's it. Well, the, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the name bothers my friend um, who's upset with me all the time about uh, I just can't get past the name, man. I, he thinks about dead cats and that's it for him. Yeah. <laughs> well, the idea well, was, you it know, does sort of conjure the we, image of a. We also can't get past the name because it's our name. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Back then, times were tough. <laughs> it's that a was different around- kind of get past, but you can't. It was 2010. It was a recession. And people said, what, what kind of music do you play? Well, it's recession rock. It's, you know, it's what we're doing right now. Wow. And times are tough. We got the banjo and this acoustic guitar, fire the drummer, no bass player, just, you know, stripped down. Mm-hmm. You find a dead cat, you, you make a hat out of it. You just got to be sort of threadbare. I see. I don't know. That's how we started. It was a country theme. Um, accordion player's fiance at the time, Jay. Uh, joined our band. We had a different drummer then. That was a little before Steve. And then we eventually had Steve. So prior to making the album Station Change, we were this sort of countryish Americana outfit, five-piece band with accordion. Mm-hmm. And then we started stepping into more of an indie rock sound. Um, and somehow the accordion allowed us to do that, where it created this sort of um, common thread. I see. Where we could switch from one genre to another, even as we got into more funky music. And she's playing on our current EP, although she doesn't play with us live anymore. Um, the accordion, people would come up to us and they would go, it's amazing. You can play all these different styles of music, but it still holds together. And I said, it's the accordion. She just kind of, she's the glue. Yeah. Um, as I said, she kind of got smart and said, you know, I'm done with these guys. So she's, she's left, but we kept the bass player. Yeah. She had, uh, we made our, our album station change. Uh, we followed that up with a live album, which was, uh, a nod to Station Change, a couple of the songs that were from that album we played live. And okay. then we threw in some country songs, Americana songs. The idea was, you know what, let's kind of be done with this Americana roots music. Uh, but before we're totally done with it, let's just put it on a live record. I don't want to go into a studio and record these things for real. Yeah, but let's be put nice them to down. capture them. I'm glad that you yeah. thought you had that thought because we do need to capture things for posterity. And yeah. as you say this, Stuff and you tell this story, and I'm thinking, okay, we're talking about a an Americana type band with a, an accordion, but I'm still having a hard time conjuring what that is. So for our listeners, they're probably sitting out there going, "What does that mean exactly? What does that sound like?" <laughs> it's so not as what weird are the influences sounds, <laughs> of a uh, of an Americana type band that's got an accordion? 
take out the accordion for a minute and yeah, let's just yeah. address the Americana description. Oh, a lot of those songs would just be sort of a one, four, five, you know, three, four chords in a song. Mm-hmm. Uh, no real jazzy chords. And it's kind of a folky Americana kind of vibe. We had a song called Ain't No Kind of Good Love, which was sort of about the uh, Bill and Sookie. What was it? The Vampire Show on HBO? This True Blood. True Blood. Yeah, that's right. Hey, I'm useful. Thank Look you. That. That's right. The, that. We had a song about the, uh, you know, bad love going okay. on. Um, and I don't know. Does that help describe it? Uh, it's kind of a country twang, swampy, Americana kind of vibe. Okay. So Americana. Mm-hmm. He keeps give using him, that Give word. him some bands because he's looking for, gosh, sort of, would it be Country-ish. New, new I mean, there's country and then there's country. Right. And I, I don't know how to get my head around it. Like if the Stones. So when you say swampy, yeah. it's more blues. It's more yeah. rooted in trash. Yeah. Okay. It's like a, it's not Nashville. It's a little no, more no. muscle south, shoals. More south. Uh, okay. More so, uh, Alabama, maybe. Louisiana. A little more, yeah. Like uh, True Blood. Gotcha. <laughs> so now let's introduce sure. the accordion because when you put the accordion in, sonically speaking, you can, it's, you've stepped into Zydeco territory. Yeah, but we didn't. Uh, no, it, but it, was, it wasn't like a, like a it wasn't a Zydeco thing. On our recordings, people thought it was a synthesizer. Okay, great. They, wow, that, mm-hmm. that patch is really cool. It's not a patch. That's not so, a patch. A That's Bonnie, and she's got a squeeze box. Yeah. It's real. So, yeah. It's made with wax. Mm-hmm. There's yeah, wax. you should have seen what we had to do to sample that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so as you yeah. started to depart from that sound, you, you got a little more indie rock. And yeah. A little more. And it just incorporated fell together some pretty more. naturally, mm-hmm. really. I mean, um, most people wouldn't necessarily identify that there's an accordion in the band. Okay. It doesn't sound like accordion music. Yeah. In fact, I used to say that to people. We're a rock band with accordion, do but any it's not polkas. accordion. You don't no, do anything no. in three, four. You don't do anything. Right. Okay. No. Uh, where oh, was we, I? So we, we had we our should. first record, our live record. Um, I think you met us probably before the live record. I don't know, it was a few years ago. And then um, we quit playing Cullen's, you know, a couple of years. What that was really about was just a fun place for us to hang out, and we could just throw up whatever covers we wanted to play. The yeah, place they weren't restricting what. you for no. anything. And we were loving it because you guys that night were playing a lot of 80s covers. Yeah, that, a lot of bands don't, unless they're an 80s tribute band. Right. Um, but it wasn't a tribute to the 80s. Right. It was just, let me take these arrangements, let me take these tunes, let me take these lyrics, and let me adapt it to, that's what we liked about it, mm, is right. that you adapted it to, it was like an original band reimagining these written mm-hmm. compositions. That's right. We, we still like to go into it. I like the the girl songs from the 80s. Okay. That's what I call it. Like the Blondie and the yeah. Go-Go's and, uh-huh. and stuff like that. And this guy is singing... You know, Blondie song or a Madonna song. What's right. the Madonna song? It's do? not a Madonna song anymore, though, because yeah. you, you pull the arrangement right. apart and you put it back together, uh-huh. and now it's a Pato song. Yep. Or a Dead Cat Hat song. And Right, or a right, Dead right. Cat Hat song, but with Pato's voice, and he's a material girl. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's not changing the lyrics. Uh, right. Jesus. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is <laughs> kind of... And that's kind of clever clip. about it, too, because you still have the... You know, nostalgia, and you get to sing along. And I always liked the, I don't know why, but I always get a kick out of somebody who is the other, excuse me, the other gender singing a song and not changing the lyrics at all. Mm -hmm. White Stripes does that. Yeah. That guy. I like that. Jack White. He does that sometimes. There was a girl, she's the bass player, and she sang the Bill Withers tune. Who uh-huh. is he and who is Michelle he? The, 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 the Cello. I can't say her oh. name. That was a brilliant that rap? I never record. Heard that that yes. record was amazing. So funky. I like both of those things, and, she, and I didn't know that happened. Right. Mm-hmm. And wow. she's a and she's a lesbian. Well, and so go. her she adaptation of the song was who is he? And yeah. What is he to you? And it gave that song an additional dynamic. Right. And she it wasn't so just it wasn't just being true to the funky. Lyrics. Right. Right, right. Man, that girl is funky. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I love everything she does. Uh, we've had the pleasure of having some of our musical heroes on the show, like you mentioned. And when you get to pull apart songs with people who are pulling apart songs that you've loved for a long part of your life, uh, 
we had Rick Murata on the show, and that guy's my hero. I love him so much. <laughs> and he talked about this James Taylor song called uh, Hour That the Morning Comes, which is my favorite song of his. And when he brought that up, he talked about in the recording process uh, how he's always way back on the backbeat. Like his approach Relaxed. to playing a song is how far can I pull the backbeat back? Mm -hmm. And and that's become his signature. And he's so relaxed when he plays. So when you hear a recording that's got a signature like that, uh, I think when I listen to the songs that you sent me, the whole EP, mm -hmm. there's a signature. Can you identify it that easily? Can you say, this is how Tell I me play more. and this is my... <laughs> Can you, know. you can you help us? Can I help you identify, identify it? that? Uh, <laughs> well, the songs they snap along. They're kind of you know, poppy and peppy. Okay. There's an awful lot of uh, instruments. They're layered. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of layers. recording on a laptop today. There's no limit. Yep. You know, so you have to kind of be an editor. Uh huh. Um, we just keep throwing things, whatever sticks. Yeah. Um, That's kind of neat about the recording process and how it's changed. Yeah, it's yeah, that's how I've been doing it for the last ten years. I mean, I I guess when I was a kid, I had a reel to reel tape deck, and I could bounce mm -hmm. ping pong back and forth. Yeah, and make little you know, it used to be able, for a little while. I used to be able to buy these records <laughs> once you got to like thirty two. Yeah, no, <laughs> you started you a really few. no, really once yeah, you right. got to like six. Do you, do you remember they used to sell these things called drum drops? It was an album of uh -huh. just drums yeah. with like an ABA type, you know, configuration mm -hmm. or, or format. And uh, yeah, I'd throw one of those up and I'd play my bass and my guitar and I'd, I'd back, you know, go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. You run out after a while. And the way we record is um, if I'm making a new song, I'll throw up in Logic, uh, you know, some drum track. And play a bass line along with it and come up with an organization. And then I'll write some lyrics and I'll start doing some guitars and whatever. And then we'll have the recording of, in uh, the drummer's ears and he'll play his drums along with that song. You see? And sometimes those recording sessions are the first time he's ever heard the tune. Hmm. So in that afternoon or evening, he's coming up with the part on the spot. Yeah. And um, sometimes we've even re recorded because then we, we put all the bass, guitar, drums, every, or I mean, uh, sometimes accordion, horns, whatever. We put those on there. And then uh, we might play that song for another year. And he might come back and say, you know, the way I do it now, it's totally different than yeah, how we recorded it. Yeah, let me come it. back. And we have. We sure. have retracked the drums, which means we have to retrack everything else. Just because, yeah. you know, you, you get as close to a kind of a... <clears throat> uh, a clock or a, a, a click track but you know things drift mm -hmm. and when the re drums get redone a lot of the music drifts and so we just redo it it's so easy and free to uh, record that way yeah that um that describes uh, the process of what we do as far as the signature or the sound um do you think that leads to a signature all by itself just that that you in employ that process i i don't know i i think I, um we bring well, I, I do want to say this. The, the guys in the band are each walking encyclopedias when it comes to their background, their, their breadth of music mm -hmm. and understanding. I thought I was kind of badass at what I knew. And then I can't keep up with them. You know, they have conversations about all these bands I've never heard of from the 60s and 70s and We 80s can't and... keep up with you either. Well, so that's because okay. we're in yeah. our mid-20s. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. But we all, I think we all we're bring a lot to it. And um, nobody ever says no to anything. And I think what you hear in the songs are um, probably some snippets or some familiarity. Or uh, I, I don't think we rip anything off. But, you know, you might hear a sound that, that harkens back to something. Oh, sure. Yeah. Th there's a song I, I think of. You can't shuck influence. Yeah. Right. That's just it how it works. Out. It's coming out no matter what. Yeah. And for instance, I was listening to, let me see. I'll give you a for instance. I was listening to uh, Can't Live Without It. And okay. I heard the horn intro from the funky drummer. Oh, uh-huh. Okay. And I heard some... What else did I hear in there? What is that? Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -da. Mm -mm, is that funky drummer? Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Oh, it's really quick. Ba -ba -ba Stabbed. Ba -da. Right? Yeah. I was trying to put together a playlist that's just songs that have used the funky drummer. Uh-huh. Like Mama said, knock you out. Sure. And that Sh Sinead O'Connor song. And I was listening to Funky Straight Drummer. out of Compton. Wow, this song is amazing. Yeah. yeah right. So I'm only three The list goes in, on but... and on. You could really, how, <laughs> how far have a... you gotten? 
Uh, oh, I'm just now I'm like, that's like three more I can put in because yeah. I just thought of them. <laughs> uh, George Michael had a song. I don't remember which one it is. Huh. <laughs> but they did this thing. They used to do this where it would be really slow and it'd be a ballad. Right. <laughs> there, I, I did a And they'd slow it way show. down and put that reverb on, be... on the snare. I can hear that in my head. Mm. Just when you did that, mm. I could hear it. I know exactly what you mean. I Drummer. used to sit there for hours yeah. trying to, like, how do you play? How's he playing that? And then I realized, oh, they slowed it down. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of talk going, about that. He's like, like his hi hat technique is so amazing. Yeah. He's got little playing it with one hand. And it's it's scooping and closing and like every time. That's a guy who's done miles. You know, by the time they recorded that, that was, you can't, right. your left What's foot and your, Clyde Stubblefield. That's it. Oh, your yep. left hand <laughs> and your, your left foot and your right hand are behaving as a single unit. And, yeah. you know, just those little, I mean, he's making his hi-hat talk. This, this song made me do some crazy stuff that I don't think I ever did. <laughs> okay. On the, um, that there's like a crazy offbeat uh, hit to it that where I'm like, I have to really just give me a minute. It was like the, what is it? The Ray Manzarek and the doors movie was that you guys go out there. I got to figure this out. I had to go like, I'm going to, I'm going to get this. I need a minute. Yeah. I'm going to get that crazy offbeat thing to happen because that works so good with this. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. But you could, I also uh, heard a, a, I heard a little steely Dan. You I heard really, a you could Jamiroquai. deconstruct this song. Oh, I love those guys. Yeah, you could deconstruct it. Yeah. Um, there's uh, there's an upright bass and flute section mm-hmm. in the middle. It's actually uh, it's a guitar solo is playing, and then uh, I played some upright bass with a bow, and our bass player played a flute, and that to me has a kind of like a, a Jaco Pastorius sound. Like he did his live band, and they had kind of like a you know like a small big band. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you could you could take this apart in all kinds of ways. It, actually, that song. Now you mentioned it. Uh, the organ that's on that song was played by a trombone player in our area, Mike Rinta. Mm-hmm. He was a skinny kid growing up in Danville, <laughs> like I was. He's a big and, guy. Yeah, he's not a skinny kid anymore. And uh, I came to his house. Are you, Pato? But that's no, okay. No, take, I, I, yeah, I, 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 hey, we're all takes one to know one. I came to his house. I wanted to track some bone that day, uh-huh. and uh, we arranged it. And I also wanted to, to do the organ. He was, an, you know, I'm not an organ player. I'm like, yeah, you are. You you are you absolutely are. Uh-huh. I don't I don't know I don't know. Are you playing the organ? That makes you an organ player. I got him playing it. And okay. He he don't he, he was trying to come up with a part, and he goes, "I'm going to go take a piss. Why don't you come here and play the organ for a minute? If we Let me just listen." Also acknowledge that he's a bad motherfucker on the Badass. trombone. He is. Yeah. We should get him. Well, he, we actually tracked him on some bass bone. Okay. On a couple other tunes. Yep. So he goes off to take a piss, and he says, "Go play my organ. You know, see what it, you know what you come up with, and I'll think about it." And, he, and I'm and he goes, "The, the keys are kind of greasy." And I'm thinking, this is like a keyboard term for how the keys are going to be. I don't know what this means, you know. And I sit mm-hmm. down at the organ, and my fingers go swoosh. And they were physically greasy. <laughs> Covered. Like he like, had been eating ribs and playing the organ. 17 years of cooking, you know, brisket and all yeah. kinds of junk in his little apartment there. Oh, and the, it just it. covered it's the organ. Oh, oh, that's what he needs. It. It's coding. Mike, come on the Break did. It Down show. You know why? Because I love you. He's great. Yes. Yeah, it's great. You're, and anybody who's guy. got an actually greasy... <laughs> organ that didn't come where out where are we right. going now it's like, Bud's, not it's like Bud's right. Burgers so, yeah. on his organ I gotta see this organ I'm like what right. look at the spots of oil everywhere yes wow. I don't typically uh, broadcast that I would like to see a man's greasy organ but <laughs> there we go uh, you know in this particular case we're hoping that uh, we have ha- we have enough context so mm. let's see what else did I hear on that EP you know what um uh, the Lincoln Town Car song. Oh, the funky uh, disco. Favorite. You know my what favorite. I heard? I Funky disco, yes. Mm-hmm. That's your favorite? It's my favorite song. I, I think of those, of the songs on the EP, definitely. I might say the same. You know, know what I heard when that bass line <laughs> came in? I heard the my Style other. Council. Oh. And I, kind of a I Motown. just don't hear enough of that old, yeah, Motown-ish kind yeah. of. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's wholesome, but it's funky, but it's you know it's a lot of but it's but it's, and it's got a thing about it that's really very clean and very polished, and at the same time very loose. Hmm. I don't know how you pull that off, but you know maybe it's the Kuika. 
<laughs> we that's play super. The it's, that's it's really low. I promise. It's just the bass line, you know. And the uh, it's and almost the like when you see a guy who's really comfortable in a suit. Yeah, interesting. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, the guy's wearing a suit. He's got the you know sure he meets the dress code, but there's nobody in here as comfortable as that guy. Wow. Yeah. Well, that'll be nice guy for the bass player to hear. Guy Richie, he's the most he's comfortable guy. guy in a suit. He's hmm. a smart guy. You see him, he's into wearing suits. I got to say, our bass player is the best looking, best dressed guy in the band. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> the, Jay's going to listen to this and he's going to be, what the, what? Jay. Uh-huh. Yep. Jay's like fashion. I, I try. He Me knows about I, everything. Alan he knows about and, socks. Alan and I, we try. Okay. But Jay doesn't have to try. I, I don't try. Got try. It. He just does it. I don't try. He's got, they send him a box of cool clothes. I don't know. That's, he's probably got one of them services. <laughs> is that true? I'm just Does joking. he belong to the I thing really where they know. send you the box of cool clothes? I doubt I it. I think he, he probably, they probably figure out what to do based on what he does. Okay. Yeah. He's a sharp dude. It's kind of like yeah. that. It's like, I know what I'm doing kind of, but man. <laughs> he is very comfortable to He's suit. a guy That's who so can funny. So do that and suit. be <laughs> expressive. I want to wear a suit and be that comfortable. Right? A lot of people are like, ooh, I have to wear a suit. I guess I have to wear one of these shirts. And I'm not quite sure in this tie. Uh, I'm so me. uncomfortable. Yeah, that's me. And <laughs> then there's the guy who's like, no, you know what? I'm going with this pocket square because it sends a different message. And you're like, you're over here sending messages. (laughs) I'm just trying not to have a camel toe. Um, I love suits. And I used to be in a swing band, swing ska band. Yeah. which Which is what we like originated that shit. And anyways, that's a. That's a grumbly moment for me, uh, but because it was like 1993, you important. really did originate that stuff. When like nobody was doing when that. When the squirrel nut or zippers were before all that, still on the teeth. I mean, before they before had the hits. Rat Pack uh-huh. resurgence. Basically, we were like nobody though. Hmm. But wearing a suit to play live and with hot lights, it's not very fun. Yeah. Yeah. So you you can be as comfortable as you want walking around and, and then like you sit down at the drums. Yep. Sitting down at the drums in ten satiny, pounds of wool. A satiny green suit. Uh huh. I'm like, okay. Not and exactly shorts. breathing. Two songs and then the jacket's coming off. Yeah. <laughs> right. My shirt might come off next. <laughs> now it's a party. Yeah. So not, not my not with me without a shirt. You don't want to see that. What are your intentions for the EP? Are you? Uh... We're gonna release it in a month or so. I don't have a hard date. Maybe April Fool's Day. Uh, maybe four twenty. I don't know. But between now and then, I really need to get this music reviewed. I say I we we need to get this music reviewed by somebody that's gonna listen to it and have some. Something to say about it, kind of like what you're doing right now. Hmm. I like when people I'd say we're reviewing it already. When when people review a song in terms of its context, uh-huh. and you know, I heard this and what it means and that kind of stuff, and I don't know where to start about finding someone. Anyway, right now is about trying to get some people to hear our music and maybe write up a review mm-hmm. prior to the release so that that can all kind of happen together. Okay, and another. <laughs> part of your question what do you do what what are our intentions and we probably don't know what our intentions are with regard to right now do we press a cd is that even a word you press do you, yeah you is that create, a thing anymore do you make cd with this What's music this? do you press what? vinyl i don't think you press cds actually no physical media you just you just etch them with lasers do we etch a cd do we do we press vinyl do we just make it Streamable for now, uh, you know, that's something we the band has to discuss. Yes, it is April, and we have completed our laser etching. <laughs> we, have etched, we have etched a new CD for you people. Yeah. Are you happy? Isn't this wonderful? Well, that's kind of a very right, right. now kind of question, you know, yeah. what our band's doing. And mm-hmm. I've, um, I've, in fact, we're going to be at a radio station tomorrow in Davis, and uh, I've talked to the kids up there, and I said, well, you know, what are, what are bands giving you? Are they giving you vinyl? Are they giving you CDs? What are they doing? Oh, yeah, they give us CDs. That's our preferred Mm. Thing that, you know, yeah, uh, they're still a college uh, radio station. Yeah, they got CD players. Yeah, and they like it. They don't like dropping the needle on the vinyl because you know, right? Like skip. However, they are not your record buying public. What's your record buying public doing? Good. Well, uh, I'm one of the. That's what we're. That's what we're after, right? And, so. Yeah, and well, that's uh, more research what, to do there. You know, what do we mean by records? Right. He buys we. Well, he buys records. Yeah. LPs. Well, let's say that, okay, if we're referring to records as bodies of work that mm-hmm. are recorded. Mm-hmm. Albums. And then I would say. You can call, yeah, you can go into whatever actual media 
Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah. I think when I speak to the when I when I say the word record, I, I'm thinking about the EP mm-hmm. as the a album, a, as right. a total record, and then you know what are you going to do with that? Mm-hmm. If you're going to press CDs with it, you could get cute and make those CDs that are shaped like something. Hmm. Uh, like what? I've seen CDs shaped like a donut. Yeah. Shaped like what? Oh, so, okay. CD shape. This is a, yeah. a, a perhaps a lesson for some of our listeners. When a <laughs> yeah. CD is read by a CD player, it's not like a vinyl record where mm-hmm. it starts at the outer edge and works its way in. I it starts that. at the inner edge and works its way out. Oh, yeah. So if you have a limited amount of information, let's say that six CD would tracks. hold an hour. If you have six tracks and that's 30 minutes, you only really need half of the physical space on the CD. Mm-hmm. So you could cut it into the shape of the sun or a star. Th- Chinese throwing star or a saw blade because you're not using those outer edges. Wow. You could cut it into the shape of a, you could cut it into a, a rectangle if you a wanted cat. to. I think that would really piss but off my cat. CD player. <laughs> Actually, like, you know. What the hell is this? Yeah. I, I don't know that it does. I remember there it was a. flying out at you and it stabs you in the neck. Yeah. <laughs> now we got um, another problem. And suddenly you have a liability on your hands. <laughs> so that's another conversation. I knew I should have moved on from media. Uh, we're going to refer any listeners who have questions about that to the break it down show legal department. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Anyway, (laughs) the, uh, the, the record for, you know, for what it is, uh, this episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Can now be consumed in a number of ways. And if you're looking at your audience, how do you think your audience is consuming it? Uh, we'll, we'll put it up uh, in as many ways possible. Mm-hmm. So, like we had before. So we'll, it'll be up on Spotify and our band camp page. Yeah. Uh, it's already Buy on it SoundCloud on. right now, and I even put it on YouTube. It hasn't released yet, but I also needed to make it sort of accessible and available to people such as yourself, where right. I want to say, you know, I want you to be able to hear this. Yeah. But, you know, you kind of like to have a, a birthing, you know, a, uh-huh. a moment where you're releasing it. So we'll pick a date, and hopefully you get a review to coincide with that, maybe a gig or two or something like that real quick. And, and Where yeah. are they writing reviews nowadays that's a, my question <laughs> the internet well you can read all kinds of <laughs> reviews it, it would make a lot of sense to say well i want to listen to a band like dead cat hat and see what other people have written about them yeah but i don't know where to start on the internet yeah according to captain the, obvious over here the internet <laughs> there we go as they say Go do it. Those Go forth and find a review yeah. of uh, uh, some sort of throwback 70s retro some... funk groove record called Brutalism. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. well, who's doing that? Is somebody Instagram, you know, YouTube that or whatever you people say? I don't know. Okay. Reviewers. <laughs> if there are reviewers out there, somebody who's writing a blog about... Uh, new somebody releases. who wants a challenge. Sure. <laughs> somebody who wants a challenge. Review our challenging EP. Yeah. It's Do called it. brutalism. It's called brutalism. Look up the word. Do you know what brutalism like, wow. is? No, it's please. architectural school. It's a school of architecture. No kidding. And it's that 70s kind of big cement blocky stuff you see all over Berkeley, uh-huh. all over the country, in fact. Oh, it's everywhere. Oh, it's but it's that big, ominous, brutal... That's so called that, brutalism. That's brutalism. And brute. <laughs> like that... And this is why. Modern Here's sort why. of block building with the with the glass bricks in one corner. That's it? Maybe. The, not the glass bricks. Probably not the glass bricks. That's a little more deco. That's more... Yeah. But the word brute, uh-huh. this is... I wish I could be looking at my phone and make sure I'm not saying this in a dumb way. No, we want to challenge. But I'm pretty sure brute <laughs> yeah. is French for concrete. Okay. So oh. that's why. That's why. They're made of concrete and they're like... That's it's brutalism. Brutal it's or whatever. I don't know. Concrete. And, then they, and now we have this word brutal... Which is like, you know, the walking dead. Yeah. Somebody gets an arrow in their head while they're trying to talk to somebody. If you're at <laughs> you're home, like, you could oh, look it brutal. up. You could yeah. look up brutalism. It's all over yeah. the place. It really yeah. makes sense because we should put there's that the 
Honestly. prairie school movement in architecture. Prairie and prairie school. school is the French word for wooden vagina. Is that Ooh. right? No, I'm just kidding. That's oh, wow. Nice. That's not what I was thinking at all. But yeah, I get it now. That's kind of like the, those mo- are the Millennial Falcon um, spaceship. Some of these, is kinda... That's not. That is. Is that really? Well, we're looking we're, at we're, pictures on the, hey, on the podcast. On the but we're you know, making look sounds with our voices and discussing visual things that you cannot see. But we're really not even discussing them. We're just pointing at them. Yeah, going, that. Look at that one. Oh, and that. then there's that, that one. <laughs> right. This is, wow. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. Google brutalism, somebody. Yeah. Uh, Look up some pictures because they're neat. Okay. Wow. Was it used well, in a movie? Well, all this time, I didn't know it was an architectural movement. I thought you were sort of covering an Icantina record. Anyway. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Oh. Too soon. Domestic violence. Too soon. Woo. Too soon. Um, well, we'll uh, it's to, very punchy. We'll follow up this record with a rock record that we've already pretty much finished recording. We're, we're in the process of mixing that. And that might be, I don't know, maybe six months or a year from now when we'll have the rock record out. And the rock record will kind of more dovetail with our first record, Station Change. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of going all around the bend. We've kind of got our rock record, our country-ish record, our funk, soul, groove record now. Right. And then back to kind of a rock record. Look out for Dead Cat Hat in the year 2027 to release their EDM <laughs> album. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then their album of big band ballads. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but 2020, you never uh, know where we're going to end up. We're all over the map. I just got out of my time machine, and it was pretty awesome, but I can't talk about it. Oh, I see. I might destroy the timeline. You you went forward in your time machine, and you signed an NDA, and then you came back. I wish you hadn't mentioned the EDM, because now it probably won't happen. It stands for something different in 2020. (laughs) That's that's what I was going to (laughs) say. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Good times. Now... Where do you see your your band going? What direction, uh, if you have the launch of the record that you like and you um, get a review that leads to more radio station play and you get some uh, college radio stations that are digging the record and playing it, are you guys going to book a tour? Yeah, more tours. Mm-hmm. We love to go up to the uh, the Pacific, Pacific Northwest. Northwest, regional, you know, yeah. kind of, you know, that's cool. Uh, up and down the coast. How do fun. you tour? We got a van. Sweet. And we get in it, and yeah. um, we pile all in, and you know, it's it's elbows to assholes the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> it's the old style, except it's more of a soccer mom van than a you know. Yeah, it's a black box though. Moving you know, van. It's, it's black it's but black, you know the most amazing yeah. things happen on tour one of our first tours we we played a show up in oregon in the middle of oregon someplace and uh at the end of the show <laughs> somebody invited fart. us invited us to their uh, birthday party and it turned out there was this birthday party for these guys named bob it's like the bob's birthday party and mm-hmm. it happens every year and there was about 150 people out there this whole uh like hippie situation the, there's a rainbow festival going on and you know we spent the night with them in their backyard of their house and these people partying all night and stuff you just never know what's going to happen on tour if you keep yourself open to it you know you you wind up in the you know the kindness of strangers you, you wind up in all kinds of neat situations and it's just fun i like a tour that ends up in a big party for a bunch of guys named bob and hippie <laughs> chicks the bobs i yeah. like i yeah. like this story uh <laughs> on these tours we we used to, uh, there was this book, it was called Book Your Own Tour, hmm. and it was pretty cool because it described what a tour setup was like for an indie band, which essentially was, here's how you outfit your van, here's how you shelve it out wow. so that you have a place to put your you know, Fender Twin and your, and it had essentially a four-piece band set up a little rack system so that you could fit all your stuff and sleep in the van. Boy, that's anal. <laughs> and then yeah, wow. it had, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was a, a, a real practical how to manual. Yeah. And then it had a directory. The second half of the book was a directory of all the clubs and across the, the country that <laughs> I don't remember the laundromats. <laughs> so it was like, you know what, which one of you go? Okay. Bass player is pretty good looking. Your job to land a girl who's got an apartment with her own laundry. <laughs> yeah, the so, couches and, and hopefully carpets. Yeah, carpets. Sleeping carpets would help. But you did carpet the, the shelving so that you could put your amp under the yeah. shelf and sleep on top of the carpeted shelf. Smart. In the van. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, 
But uh, and it's I'm glad to hear that you guys are still kind of keeping that spirit alive. A plan is you know it's I don't know tell you it, plan live is what it's all about. It's fun to make recordings and stuff, and it's fun to reproduce it live. And you know somehow we managed to do that. We had a trumpet player for about six months. He got busy with school, so I guess we could. I'd really like it if we had, had another trumpet player. Three trumpet players on the record, did you not? Uh, a couple. Um, our guy, uh, our bass player is a fabulous trombone player so he's playing trombone on a bunch of tracks you know what i think about the trombone i love the trombone so much because when you're in a place and the band's loading in when you see a trombone case shit just got real yeah (laughs) that's kind of how the accordion was right what's that big thing on her back it's oh, a Miss oh just you wait right so it was like one of those things where when you see that instrument come in you go oh Huh. Mm-hmm. Something serious going on here. Maybe we won't go to that other pub. Maybe we'll stick Maybe around we'll here. Maybe we'll stick around here. But do you find do that... good ginger beer. It's one thing when you have a... Just... Let's say you have a band, and they're playing covers, and they got a couple horn players. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a trumpet player, maybe a tenor sax player, and they got a little horn section going. Yep. When you add a trombone to that, suddenly it opens up. A whole, because now you got a thick ass chord. Yep, yep. And people That's don't true. accidentally play the trombone. Mm-hmm. A trumpet you can stumble upon in a pawn shop and go, "Yeah, I've always kind of wanted to play the trumpet. I'll play the trumpet." And you get a trumpet, and so you get guys who are mildly okay at the trumpet. <laughs> but a guy <laughs> who plays play. the trombone. That's a more physical instrument. It's more of a commitment. If slide you trombone. grew up playing a slide, slide trombone, trombone, you had to yeah. lug that shit home from school, mm-hmm. and that requires dedication. Yeah. So it mm-hmm. speaks to a different level of, I think, when you when a trombone case comes bouncing in the room, you go, oh, shit. You know, Here we just go. a thought, just a thought. While you're saying that, I'm also thinking about Barry Sax. Oh, yes, that's like a, absolutely. Same, like, you know, See, wow, if a band's got difference. a Barry Sax, you're like, holy shit, these guys are serious. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because let's face it. Can you, I could probably thumb through my phone and put together... 27 quartets that include a guitar player, a bass player, a singer, and a drummer. Right. Mm-hmm. How many bands are you going to come up with a Barry Sax? No, I know. Right. One, maybe, if you're lucky. There's those guys that play on the subway. Yeah. Like New York or someplace. Crazy. Really good. Really good. Well. And yeah, if you've got three, that guy. But that three drum, the trumpet, well, it could be a trumpet or it could be, uh, what's the other one? The the It's like a bigger trumpet. Coronet. Coronet. Mm-hmm. We had a guy who played trumpet and coronet. Flugelhorn. Mm-hmm. Or flugelhorn. But I think it was a coronet. How much bigger is and the French And a sax. Horn? That's considerably French bigger, horn? right? Yeah. That like a big, that's the big round thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a coronet. Okay. And flugelhorn and a sax is what and, uh, Chuck, Chuck Mangione played. Yeah, right. Right. And uh, trombone, we had that in the swing band. I was in Theoreticats with okay. my brother. And he was able to arrange those three thing so it sounded like a big giant a big, thing. giant thing yeah because mm-hmm. he could just suddenly you know, having the that, t- that whatever he did baritone I don't voice it. that's why i'm a drummer yeah thickened like, the core whatever he did wow that was awesome now i'm gonna keep Bow. hitting this thing with a stick <laughs> you don't need 15 horns yeah you need three you need three and you, need you need three you three. need three if one of them is a trombone or a barry sax there yeah you go. yeah so yep there music lesson so there you go today. you got four people in your band get some horns also trombone players out there barry sax players out there thank you guys and ladies <laughs> also i will say this not many things hotter than a chick who plays a trombone or a barry gonna, sax i was gonna say especially the ladies when, we, the, we know when a chick, chick that plays takes on, the trombone do you know who uh yeah. genie geiger man i've been trying to drag genie yeah. geiger on this show for so long genie she's a Come powerful on, hitter you know what you need? She's tough to grab, though. She's she's busy. busy. She's writing stuff. She's flying around. She's she this is and that band. busy. I mean, just stay she, at just hang out at Kimball's. Yeah, and eventually you'll catch her on the way when she's in town. Right, right. <laughs> I listen to a podcast, uh-huh. and every time they have an idea for a new show, they have a little one of those little bells that goes ding. ding. Here's and every ding. time somebody says like that'd be a, make a great show, ding. You okay. just hit it. Somebody <laughs> hits it. That's all you need for all this right. podcast. That it's sounds awesome. good. I'll, we, I'll pipe it in. We keep on flirting with the idea of having making a, podcast. a podcast. Yeah. And making a board game, but that's a whole other thing. A board game. You should make that a podcast so cool. about making a board game. What? <laughs> yes. Uh, what's stop, what's stopping opposite. you? It's too much work. 
It's too much work. We took it, it gonna, took four minutes to set. We're going to take up. a class with you, oh. so you can teach us how to do it. Yeah, you make this easy. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm getting more. Uh, you noticed, like what? Yeah, 30, you warmed right 35 up. Thirty-five minutes went away, and I didn't say nothing. Uh huh. And you that was a right double up. negative, and I caught myself, and I'm like, That's "How right. could? How dare you say I didn't say nothing?" That's, That's Steve Glover. Negative. He ain't said shit. I'm a grammar police guy over here. Are you a grammar police guy? Yeah. Well? You know what really Nobody bugs me lately? <laughs> Subject object pronoun disagreement. Ooh. I just mm, I hear it all the time and I get it's like hey, to come to the store with Pato and I. Oh, that drives me bananas. Pato and me. Yeah. Exactly. Clunk. And you know how what you do? It goes yeah. clunk. You take the other, you take person, the other out, person out. And then it makes You're sense. Does it make sense? Are sentence? you a caveman yeah, or does it make right. sense? Yes. Are you a caveman or does it make sense? That's what I tell the kids. It goes clunk on your ear. Indubitably. Why are you telling the kids this? What makes you tell the kids this? I work with kids in schools. And you actually are the grammar police. No, I'm just a guy in a classroom going like, no, don't do that. Yeah. That works. Here's how you do it and be smooth. But that sounds weird. Yeah, it sounds weird because you're not used to hearing it. Right. But that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be. There's a reason. Trust me, I'm a guy who's comfortable in a suit. (laughs) And what, I know how to wear a man What kind hat. of drumming do you play? Uh, well, when I was growing up, I listened to a lot of my dad's records, and he's a sax player. Oh. So I listened to a lot of T.O.P. I studied with Dave uh, when I was... Uh, I love to say I studied with Dave. I took a f- series Dave? of lessons from David Who? Garibaldi, and then oh, he okay. was done with me because I was not nearly serious enough. Because... Uh-huh. My thing about the drums is I love the drums and I also love chicks. <laughs> and so I found out that I could love the drums and it led to me having more opportunities to love chicks. It worked like that for you? It didn't work for yeah. you with the guitar. So It didn't work with me because I'm really shy. Oh, mm. yeah. But okay. I'm okay so, now. Yeah. So I got a lady. Tell so us I'm about good. these chicks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so chick number 37. How does that Let's work? Mostly about. the, I've been married for about 71 years. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, so when you were like so, a fetus. Yeah. No reason to play like drums anymore. Are you playing? playing, game, playing Not much. Field. Not much. See? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm getting back to it. Uh, you know, we, uh, we raised some kids. We, yeah. You met my son. Um, and now I've got a little more uh, opportunity to concentrate on the things I really like. What direction do you go in? Uh, as far as the drums, yeah. I'm a funkster all yeah. the way, all the way. It's fun. Ohio yeah. players, tower power, yeah. average white band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can, you know what you can, you can do. Go ahead. Perfect. You can, uh, Steve you know is what really you can good do at this. Go ahead. I'm so good at this. <laughs> you, you know what you can do with funk uh-huh. is you can do, you can play, at the same level you would rock, uh-huh. and you sound like, wow, listen to what he's doing. Listen to all the amazing, just laying down the beat. Mm-hmm. That's all that matters. It's the same for me yeah. with anything, but because I'm all about He's a slave that to the Ringo. groove, that Steve Glover. I'm all about the Ringo. Yeah. Like, just put the beat down. And with funk, mm-hmm. you can put the beat down, and it's not boring ever. Mm-hmm. It's like always fun and you get to do crazy stuff. Well, I don't do that much crazy stuff. While I studied with Dave, I had a uh, very profound effects from his teachings, which were quite simple. Play two and four real hard. Every backbeat is a rim shot. Do not desert that backbeat. That's the most important thing ever. Also, your grace notes come up this high. And your backbeat comes up this high. That's it. Man. So he taught a lot of things that were much more subtle and much more complex that I wasn't ready for. But what I was ready for was pay attention to dynamics, serve the groove, and hit that backbeat hard as fuck. Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing I love, bossa novas. Oh. I love bossa nova. I, I spent so long making myself learn. Yeah. The intricacies of bossa nova, mm, mm, so that mm. I can, and it may, and it translates to so many other things. It really does. Or now I can play like this crazy six eight thing while I'm playing four four over here. Uh huh. We do a, a psychedelic furs song. Yeah, called I, Love My Way. I, I have to do it bossa nova. Yes, I have to. Uh. And it's like an it's like a, what do you what would be what would be the PC way to say it? 
It's like a white boy. Mm-hmm. That's PC, right? Yeah. You play white boy bossa. <laughs> it's like bossa. a white boy bossa nova. Yeah, yeah. it's like Herb Alpert. What does no, that I'm mean exactly? It means it's not it's not super authentic, not but Eddie it's Rubin. definitely in the field. Well, let's cool let's face it. Who's who's super authentic playing a bossa nova Sergio anymore? Yeah, Mendes. And guess what? Hmm. Neither one of us is him. So right. Let's say. But I try that our that. bossa is authentic to us, <laughs> just the same way as. Pato is a material girl. That's an, that's an open... See how I bring that back? Yeah. See that? An open-mindedness. <laughs> yeah. Callbacks. <laughs> the, the life event that happened to me that made me love the bossa nova, or made me realize my love for the bossa nova was, I was playing in rock bands when I was 18, and enjoying myself tremendously, and uh, getting real physical, and sweating a lot, and had long hair, and... We were enjoying the 80s. And you then too. my dad at some point, while he was playing, my dad and my uncle were always busy. And one day he said, and my dad and I did not, when I was growing up, I was a shithead, man. I was an <laughs> asshole. Uh, and my dad and I, and my dad was, I didn't get along with my dad because he mm. just wanted me to just behave a little. And one day he called me and said, hey, uh. I had a gig this weekend. He interested in playing a gig? And I was like, uh, I guess. No, not really. But, and he goes, well, I really need, I really need a drummer. Will you do this gig with me? You, you, you're you not doing anything. And I said, yeah, okay. I'll play with you guys. And he goes, all right, we'll do one rehearsal, two rehearsals. And I was like, I'm cool. Mm-hmm. I'll pick it up and I'll make notes and stuff. I'll deliver. Don't worry. Oh, big shift. Cool. Yeah. So, We would go to rehearse, and we had such an amazing time rehearsing because our whole dynamic changed. Because now we Mm -hmm. were bandmates. Mm. Uh, He wasn't my dad in that room. He was a guy who heard, hey, you know what? We should really go back to the bridge on this song because that bridge is awesome. And if we do that chorus long enough and everybody's having a good time and they're still dancing, there's no reason why we can't, we could go back to the head if you want. You know, we were peers in the room Mm -hmm. and we could talk about this stuff and work it out. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole different, and that's when I learned that my dad was just a dude. Yeah. You know, and he, he loves my mom, but he likes chicks. So we would be somewhere (laughs) and we would be driving someplace because eventually this turned to a long tenure playing with my dad and my dad would be, we'd be somewhere and he'd go, Ooh, and I go, what? And he'd see, there would be a girl like 200 yards away (laughs) in a trench coat. And I would be like, how on earth did you see that? Mm -hmm. And he can see that. (laughs) And I learned like, man, you are an impressive dude. Through the trench coat, he can see the hot pants. Oh, yes, absolutely. But here's the the thing that really happened, because I I exaggerate a little. Um, The thing that happened was we went and played that gig, and the gig went well, and it was a great workout for me, and we played a lot of bossa novas, and I thought, man, this is pretty fun. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying this. And then we got paid. And I was like, wait a minute. Is this for the whole band or do I get to keep this? And it was like, you know, here, here's 120 bucks. Huge. And I was like, $120? <laughs> yeah. What are you guys doing next weekend? Oh, we're right. playing another one of these. Oh, and not only that, but this lady right here, this is Gina. She's bringing us prime rib. And I was like, oh, yeah, what yeah. the hell? You guys are eating prime rib and getting paid? Mm. Do we have to pay for the prime rib? <laughs> no. Comped. So, yeah. Teach you right. Suddenly, I was like, hold on, because I'm used to, like, all right, guys, that was great. Thanks for playing. Uh, you owe us $31 for the beer. Oh, God. And it was like, well, hold uh, on. I thought we were getting $200 out of this. Yeah, you guys drank $231 yeah. worth of beer. <laughs> so had a great time, got oh, to know shit. my dad, got paid, ate well, and uh, played a lot of bossa novas. So there's a real sweet spot in That's my That's nice. Yeah. My dad and I had a thing. My dad played guitar in the Beach Boys for a little while. Wow. In, in uh, Burbank. Huh. When he was in high school. I was almost getting ready to be born my mom and dad were in high school and uh they called him up and he was for about three months playing around the circuit of high schools yeah you know i was born in 65 so this is a little before that and uh when i was a kid he brought me a a bass and uh we just would sit in my room and do the blues Uh and uh you know i was in sixth grade or something and but you were making music 
Yeah. Yeah. And we started doing some songs. Uh, it got better. We got um, doing like songs by like um, the Brothers Gibb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The you original know, Brothers Gibb. Yeah, in the late 70s. Yeah. yeah. We're doing all the funky, funky stuff. How Deep Is the Your B- Love. No, but you guys were playing Bee Gees songs. Because yeah. they had a, another the life before they were the Bee Gees. Yeah. The, 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 what are they called? The 60s version of them. The Hollies. No, not the Hollies. No, no. They were called. No, they the were the Brothers, brothers Gibb. Gibb. The Brothers yeah. Oh, okay. You said it right. I said it. <laughs> yeah. They, were they that. weren't called the Gibb Brothers. They were called the and Brothers And they had like Gibb. an Australian the TV Gees. show. Right. And they did more, whatever folky is for Australia. They were 60s. Yeah. In right. The 60s, they were yeah. a solid thing. Right. And then they did the disco thing. My mom started playing piano. And mm-hmm. so we were uh, kind of. It's White Soul. Oh, Blue Eyed okay. Soul. Yeah, Blue Eyed Soul. That's yeah. better. All right. That makes more sense. But yeah, I, I had the, the the dad thing going on too. That was that was really nice Disco. for us. He's he's a he still plays bass. He's in, down in Southern California playing like in a church band. All right, and he's playing the hell out of his bass and slapping him. Dad, don't slap the bass like that. Nobody right. wants to hear that. He's dressing like Verdine White. He's going. He's got like a pressed afro, and he's wearing a lot of red shiny suits. <laughs> Platform <laughs> shoes. Like, how you doing, Dad? Ah, you're looking frilly, pretty good. The frilly shirt. Yeah. You know what we were talking about Just drums, out. too? I don't know if you noticed this. I, I love buying old 70s albums and putting them on my turntable, and, and uh-huh. the, the sound pops out really hard. The toms are huge yeah. on those 70s recordings. Okay. You were talking about, like, the the high, the, the backbeats here, and this is there. Yeah. And the, this, uh, the grace note might be a little more. Those mm-hmm. toms are going boom, 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 like harder than anything. Yeah. yeah. A lot of that stuff. That's lately I've been noticing and a lot of been, that. We've been trying to get that sound. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. And tuning the there, toms. There were a lot of toms correctly. back then that didn't have bottom heads. Yeah, they stuck the That's mic true. underneath and them. And they 80s, just stuffed the mic 80s in there. style. Yeah. 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 Huge. I didn't. Stuart Copeland. I wasn't into that sound. Hmm. I've seen that. I didn't dig that sound. I might be thinking about like the cars. Okay. Or even Elvis Costello. Yeah. I mean, th- things are just hitting me left and right. Like I never realized this growing up. My stereo is a little better now and. I'm just hearing this stuff. That's yeah. like, man, that's that's up there. We had Stuart Copeland on the show. I know. Uh huh. Man, I, I didn't listen to it yet because yeah. I wanted. Did to you be Did you know first. his solo music? It was like after the police. Yeah, yeah it was it's terrible. And before, I like. No, I'm just kidding. No, it was good. <laughs> and before. No, I didn't. Yeah, not that's right. When he basically enjoy the his uh, songs mm. with the police, you could always hear the Stuart Copeland song, which. Admittedly, was much better than the Andy Any Summers song. other day. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Miss Gradenko. Yeah. He's, he's my hero. Yeah. So I was like, there's no way I'm watching your show with him. Yeah. Because I, th- I think it was a video because there was, you could see it. No, about Clark Or Kent? there's a picture. We did. It was just a picture. No. Okay. So I saw the picture. He, he put it in the text and I was like, I'm going to come here and do this first. Yeah. <laughs> before I'll you be listen way to that. too nervous. Okay. So I, I did that show hero. with my partner, Pete. Yeah. I and did. a lot of that show was Pete talking to Stuart Copeland and me going like this. Wow. Uh, uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause yeah, he's my His hero mouth too. was wide open yeah. and he's just staring. Which is weird because, Folks. you know, as far as his playing is concerned, I lo- love his playing, but he was a lot less influential on me. Than mm-hmm. Rick Morata or mm-hmm. than J.R. Robinson, and I didn't have any problem with those guys. But, but when you're in it. the room with Stuart Copeland, he is a yeah. bona fide fucking rock star. Yeah. Well, yeah, and everything I ever tried to do on a hi hat is because of Stuart Copeland. Right. Mm-hmm. And he's he's credited as the hi hat in the song. Uh, I believe it's Big Time on Peter Gabriel. Oh, is that oh. true? It just says <laughs> hi hat uh-huh. Stuart, Stuart Copeland. Copeland. I'm like, of course, it's just hi hat. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. Here, just play this. And I'm th- I think he did a few other songs on that, but man. Sure. There's Jeez. always that fight. Being, whose band is it? His or Sting's? Or like, he says, it's my band. Yeah. Yeah. You listen to the earlier, what's the name of the earlier band? Clark Kent. Clark Kent. Oh, yeah. And you're like, this is the police. It just yeah. doesn't have Sting in it. Right. Yeah. I mean. However, yeah. uh, when it comes down to could Clark Kent have been a band without Sting or could the police have been a band without Stuart Copeland? I don't think that there's a fair way to answer well, that question true. in either direction. Yeah, there's no taking fair any enough. of the three That was out. a magical moment with a magical recipe. And thank God we all got to witness this, yeah, yep. this uh, convergence. Andy did a good yeah. job of not getting in the way. He did a spectacular job. Very English. Yep. And to, and he <laughs> was very such sort of like, things. oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't think of it, you know. And Counterintuitive been, things. You would just be like, what? Yeah. Wow, listen to that. Yeah, they were so amazing. He's not and, just And not one of them. Out. Even though Sting was the... And this is what Stuart said to us, because we sort of touched on the subject. 
And he said, and you know, I didn't want to go in there and go, all right. So Stuart, it's nice to meet you. Listen, I hear you were the asshole. (laughs) Was it you? It was, you were the bad apple, right? (laughs) How can I make you cry? he admits that, yeah, I could have been a little nicer. You know. Competitive. I think his brother was probably an intense factor I should, in that band. I imagine so. Uh-huh. And you know the drums are the drums are big in the police records. Oh sure, they're big. Yeah, I think his brother had something to, to do with that too. They're thirty three percent of the album. One of the things that he said so, was yeah. that we were not ever a, the type of band that had some kind of uh, you know structured hierarchy as to how we wrote songs. Whoever had the best idea first mm. was the guy who spoke. And he said, now when I look back, I realize that Sting usually had the best idea first. Hmm. So, Fair enough. Props. Yeah. Sure. And then, hey, back off, play the drums, here's your space, and do the hell out of it. And we loved it. And it turns out that they butted heads or whatever, but in the middle of that, they made some fantastic fucking records. You know, right. I, I play bass and sing, and it's a hard thing to do. Uh-huh. Um, I pulled my frets out of my bass when I was 15 because wow. of Sting. I mean, yeah. I wanted to sound like Jocko, but I didn't want to give up rock music. Mm-hmm. But when I saw Sting, made Sting it okay. playing rock music with a fretless bass, yeah. I can do that. I pulled my frets out and I made my, I still have my fretless bass. Um, but he can sing and play the bass. And it's a weird Brilliantly. chewing your gum, walking at, and talking at the same time type of thing that you, you learn to do eventually. Yeah, um, especially spirits. Now, but he also as a guitar player, playing guitar and, and singing, yeah. that's different because you keep a constant beat. Mm-hmm. I'd say the same for the drums. It's not that mm-hmm. bad playing the drums and right. singing. Sometimes it gets complicated, but usually if what you're doing is playing eighth notes on the hi-hat and laying on the backbeat, you can sing just yeah, fine. Yeah, totally. But the bass is different. The bass is different. It's got a syncopated thing usually. Right. It's a little, you're playing it's off hard. of stuff. You're, right. And yeah, and that's truly doing two different things at the same time. Yeah. So. Right. If I'm in the middle of a crazy drum solo, there's no way I'm singing it. <laughs> okay. Maybe. Fair uh, enough. Fair just yeah. one note. Maybe that's the best I could do. Yeah. <laughs> I throw up the horns while I hit that note. Um, yeah, that'd be good to watch. Anyway, so let's round third base here and say this. Uh, you should come back. You should come back. Yeah. And we should do this again. With Jay and Alan. Love to. Yeah. And if you decide that you want to uh, produce a podcast, then you should. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should. Jeez. Listen, All we for me, is- it's been an amazing excuse to meet all my heroes. And I haven't met them all yet, but come on, I fucking went to Stuart Copeland's house. Who gets wow. the chance to do that? And he did the shit for free. Hey. Nice. Come on. Yeah. So, that's yeah. There you go. There you but go. there's you a big commitment wanna... there too. It's another way of performing and um yep. people might get the idea that it's just easy to do, but I don't think it is. Yeah. I think there's Probably a lot that's not. behind it. You gotta have an idea. Okay. I'll let you and know when I get one. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> Commitment. You well, your idea is conversations. Yep. That's true. Um, you know, we have an issue of talking over each other. Well, I not, haven't experienced that issue this two, evening. But. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you could me and Alan, play it correctly. We talk over each other. You and Alan talk over each other. Okay. And I just talked over you. So I usually do this show. My two co-hosts are Pete Turner and Mark Valley. And I don't do a ton of shows with Mark because he's launching a podcast of his own, which is a different subject. Uh, and I hate doing podcasts with that guy, man. He's so good looking that I even get his. Anyway. But it's but it's audio. It is audio. And you've got such a great voice. There's a dynamic that happens when he walks into a room and all the chick. He's a chick magnet. And I'm like, you know what? I got a great voice and these bitches can't even hear it. Anyway, <laughs> the problem is, no, the, th- the thing I was going to point out, though, was that when we started doing this show, it was just Pete and myself. And Pete has a great way of counterbalancing. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when we get a guest, we will triangulate on the guest. And that's fun. And I think that that's what you guys will figure out real fast. Mm-hmm. And hand do. signals. Yeah, that too. We should get some hand signals. Hand signals, yeah. What does this mean? Or what does that mean? Yeah. yeah. Or what does that mean? Or what does that mean? Right. I just did nothing. Or this thing. Two o'clock. <laughs> the fourth, what does that mean? I did nothing. Yeah. 
<laughs> but they don't know that. Right. Or you did something under the table. Anyway, right. I want to say. Uh, a thump to the knee. For everybody who's out there who wants to check out the Dead Cat Hat EP, get it on. We don't know what yet. Yeah. But definitely in SoundCloud, definitely in Spotify, definitely on iTunes. All the probably, usual places. All the usual places, yeah. Our website, deadcathat.com, will have links. Maybe CDs. Maybe CDs shaped like a cat. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's called uh, brutalism. It is called brutalism, and it's and it can be brutal. So, yeah. Steve, thank also, you. It can also be his. Otto, thank it's you. been an honor. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's been really, great, man. Really uh, kind of a big deal for us to be on your show with the with some of the other I'll guests cut it you've out. had. You brought beer. Kind of embarrassed <laughs> to be here. You brought beer <laughs> and so. water. Anyway, thanks, guys. 